Hi, this is Jim Elvidge, who holds a master's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell University and for many years has kept pace with the latest research, theories, and discoveries in the varied fields of subatomic physics, cosmology, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and the paranormal. This unique knowledge has provided a perfect foundation for his book, The Universe Solved, and I couldn't be more thrilled to have him here. Jim, how are you? I'm great. Thanks very much for having me, Greg. Looking forward to the show. Of course, man. It's a real pleasure. You know, I've uh, been really looking forward to this one. There's so many things to talk about, but let's start with this programmed reality theory of yours. I mean, it's pretty far out there. Uh, the idea that we're living in a simulation or a computer program, something like The Matrix. I've liked that idea for a while when the movie came out, but I've never really entertained it much as a real possibility until reading some of your thoughts and uh, Nick Bostrom's thoughts and now I don't know what to think, so uh, can you tell the people a little bit about this program reality idea? Yeah, sure, absolutely, and, and people are probably most familiar with it through some of the movies from Hollywood, uh, maybe some science fiction writing, Philip K. Dick, and other people who have explored these kinds of ideas over the years, um, and, that's, and that's cool, because they, they generally give some sort of um, description of it or, you know, a reason for it to be in the Matrix, for example, there was a, you know, a sinister aspect to what was behind the Matrix. Yes. Um, other people may say that it isn't, you know, that way, that it could be just simulation that, uh, that we've put together in the future and we're just running. I think that's more, uh, Bostrom's idea. Um, mm -hmm. But it actually, I mean, it goes back pretty far. Uh, Conrad Zeus, I think, was uh, uh, the first person to um, postulate the idea, and that was in 69, I believe, that uh, our world could be digital. And uh, from there, you can go in a bunch of different directions. You can say, well, it could be, it could be digital, but there could be nothing behind it. Or you could say, well, it could be digital, but there's uh, there's some programmatic aspect to it, and therefore there was a programmer. Um, or it could be that it's not an entity per se that we think of an entity, but it was more of a, a system that evolved and generated this reality, but, you know, in a, in a digital form. So, you know, all these things kind of fit into the general field of digital philosophy or digital physics, if you will, and, um, you know, it's, it, we, we can explore the, the pros and cons of a lot of the different ideas. Yeah, I mean, the thing I thought was most interesting that I'd heard you say in the past is it's very likely that at some point we'll be able to simulate reality. So isn't it also likely that we've already been there, that we're already there now? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's <laughs> Nick Bostrom's sort of philosophical, you know, logical argument, and it's, it's really hard to find fault with it. He's saying that given where we think we are, you know, we're pursuing – these kinds of simulations now. We do it with, uh, you know, massively uh, multiplayer online role-playing games, and we do it with, you know, virtual reality, and it gets more and more accurate all the time. And that, you know, we, we follow Moore's Law with the, you know, escalating speed of computers and the escalating res resolution of our screens and things like that. Uh, at some point, we won't be able to tell the difference between reality and a simulation. We're there now in terms of what we can hear, you know, we could put some unobtrusive headphones on and not be able to tell the difference between a surf or really being down, you know, at the beach and listening to the waves. Um, and from a visual perspective, if you're able to cover your full field of vision, you know, we can generate that kind of resolution um, that is equivalent to the visual acuity of the eye today. So we're, we're really close. And, right. you know, the only thing that that kind of remains to be done is is a scenario or or a you know the the richness of a of a reality and something about our memories because if we were to play a simulation put on a headset um, and uh, you know execute a simulation we know because we've got the memories that that we existed before we started the simulation and mm -hmm. and that this is just a simulation so that brings into question about you know, the idea of how how accurate are the memories, how much can we believe in the memories that we think we have. And, you know, honestly, there's a tremendous amount of research and um, brain-computer interface that's going on where memories are uh, being erased in, in mice. You know, they, they will teach a mouse how to do something, erase the memory, re-inject the memory, 
um, and, you know, and show that they, they can actually inject false memories into <laughs> mice and rats in the laboratory. So if they're doing that now, and again, we follow the progression, the logical progression of science and technology, there is going to be some day where we can suspend our memory, inject a new kind of, uh, you know, set of memory artifacts, if you will, run a simulation, and then restore our old memory again. So Boston says that's, he, he refers to that as the, the concept of post-humanism. So when you get to a point where you can generate your own sort of fantasy reality, if you will. And, uh, you know, that may be 20 or 30 years away. So his argument goes like this. If, you know, if that's possible, and, and we know that it's possible, there's only one of three things that can happen. Either we never get there, but because in the next 30 years we blow ourselves up as a society, <laughs> um, or we never get there because we make a conscious decision not to get there. And that one, I, I tend to disregard that one because I think, you know, when have we ever stared a, an interesting technology in the face and said, hmm, not going <laughs> not gonna to pursue that. Agreed. <laughs> right? I totally agree. And then the third one is we do get there, and we generate millions and millions of simulations. And so then the, if that's the case, then the odds that we're in the one 30 years before that time versus one of the millions that gets generated is very small. So if you think through his logic, if you're, if you're a pessimist, you'll, you'll believe that we're going to blow ourselves up in the next 30 years. If you're an optimist, you would have to believe that we're actually in a simulation. When you take that a step further, we could be just stuck in an infinite loop of digital realities within digital realities where we learn more and more and more and create another one and create another one. Yeah, and I think that's actually really an insightful thought because, you know, it's sort of like a, a fractal. Um, if you're exactly. familiar with the, the pictures that, that show these fractal images, and the more you zoom in on them, um, you see the same thing. And uh, there are a number of uh, scientists and, and physicists and so forth, Tom Campbell comes to mind, who believe that our, our reality is a fractal. And, and if you looked at, look at it at different scales, you see the same thing, the same kind of structures, not just physical structures, but the way things tend to work. Mm -hmm. um, and this whole idea of, well, we could be in a simulation now, and in our simulation we're creating simulations, you know, and in that simulation, we're creating a virtual reality game, and someday that'll be a simulation. You know what I mean? That yeah. that whole aspect of things is also uh, fractal. So it, uh, it it all kind of fits. Yeah, I mean, on the subject of fractals, I've seen those pictures where people put on one side, like, a cell in the human body, and on the other side, a galaxy, and they look yeah. so similar. Yeah. It's that same Zen philosophy point of, you know, everything is part of the whole isn't it? Yep. Yeah. I, I really like those, and, and it it's striking when you look at some of these cosmological maps of the known universe and all these little tendrils and things like that that are in the maps, and then you take a look at a, uh, a cell or something, and you see the same structures. And that's not to say that, that, that the cell is a universe for some other entities. Um, that could be a little bit of a crazy idea, or maybe not, but... You know, it's, it, the more to the point is that there's some organizing principle to our mm -hmm. reality that makes things um, group together in large scales the way it makes things group together in small scales, the way things communicate in large scales, the, the, you know, that is similar to the way they communicate in small scales, the way they form structures and so forth. Um, and that organizing principle, what is that? You know, we, we haven't discovered that from a scientific standpoint. Um, some physicists might point to things like uh, uh, string theory or grand unified field theory or something mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, those are, those are really things that, that are meant to describe um, physical matter particles and not really to describe these mega structures of our reality. So um, just the fact that they repeat at different scales is interesting by itself and kind of implies that, you know, there's some organizing force at work here. I mean, other examples of that is the you know the Fibonacci sequence and the phi ratio, that idea that there's just some type of code to it all. And I spend a lot of my time in the conspiracy world, but that kind of ties in because that is apparently the type of knowledge 
that secret societies have held on to for generations and generations and generations. And the ultimate could be that they're like, oh, yeah, well, this is the program that uh, we've created and, you know, we're living on top of it here and we could exit at any point, um, but they don't have the ability to do that. You know, wouldn't that be a trip? Well, it is really interesting. If you, I agree with you. If you go back and look at some of the, you know, the ancient texts, the Sumerian texts, or some of the, the, you know, hieroglyphs that you see at various ancient sites and things, and um, you know, try to figure out what they're what they're telling us. We tend in, in the past we've had this sort of arrogant uh, assumption that oh well they were just inferior to where we are now so they couldn't have been um, on to anything significant you mm-hmm. know but the, it, it it all it only seems to happen that the more we learn about our past the more surprised we are at how rich it was and how um, you know philosophically accurate it was or something like that. And it's the same way with the way we treat animals. The more we investigate how animals communicate and how they behave, the more surprised we are that, oh, my gosh, they have, um, you know, ecosystems and social uh, systems just like we do. Why is it that we we don't assume that in the first place? You know, why, why do we have to assume that, Humans in the past and uh, other species of animals are, are necessarily inferior to us. And why do we have to assume that we humans have the at, uh, access to all that there is or all that there could be to know? Um, I think it's a it's a very uh, you know arrogant point of view. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the universe is a weird place. We seem to figure out more about it all the time. One. Actually, one point that you've discussed in the past that I thought was really interesting is the scientific trend, um, this pattern that seems to occur where every new leap in understanding yields a larger ratio between matter and empty space. You know, we kind of discover that the universe is more empty than it is full. Um, Walk us through that trend a little bit, and, and where do you see that trend going or ending, if it ever ends? Oh sure, that one's that one's really fascinating to me, and it's actually a pattern that I just kind of noticed just a few months ago, and I, I wrote a blog on it. Um, you know, we we know that over the years we've been you know peering deeper and deeper into the atom as we get more and more powerful instruments like uh, the linear hadron collider and things like that, higher energy instruments that we can use to break apart things and, and look deeper in. Mm-hmm. So, but, but if you look at the kind of history, you you actually see a pattern. You see a trend here, which is which is was a revelation to me. So let's go back to the ancient Greeks. They yeah. thought that um, everything was made of these little hard billiard ball type um, objects, call them atoms. And uh, let's take gold for example. That gold was uh, you know gold bar consisted of a bunch of those little billiard ball type indivisible things. Um, called atoms that you that were just packed together. Well, if you pack together kind of spherical things, there's going to be some empty space in between them as as well. And the the empty space is something like 28 percent of the total space it takes up. So this mm-hmm. we didn't really advance from this theory until um, you know well into the 1800s. John Dalton um, revised the theory uh, in that time, and then there were some, you know, changes to the theory of atoms. Um, but the real breakthrough came in the early 1900s with um, uh, Ernest Rutherford's experiment that showed that there was a nucleus to the atom, and they were able to determine what the cross-section of that nucleus was, how r- roughly how big that thing was, and found out that, wow, you know, not only is not, not our, our gold bar isn't really just, like, 80% stuff, and you know, that's the word that I tend to use, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's more like 1 times 10 to the minus 15th stuff. So one part in, you know, uh, I guess that would be maybe 1,000 trillion Jeez. stuff. So it's so, mu- it's so much empty space that it's almost inconceivable. Um, but, but it didn't end there. In the, in the 60s, uh, with quark theory, they realized that, you know, the nucleus, these protons and neutrons were actually composed of something else. They're composed of quarks, and those quarks were much, much smaller, and that most of a proton was empty space. So now the 
you know, and they've been able to do some estimates on cross sections of uh, of quarks. Now they're saying that you know one our gold bar is a one part in ten to the twenty eighth um, you know stuff, and everything else is empty space. And then the string theorists came came around in the eighties and nineties and said, well, you know, even quarks are are made of something else. They're made of these little vibrating bits of string that um, uh, that uh, you know, vibrate at different frequencies for different particles. And the width of this string is uh, what's known as the Planck length. And the Planck length is something like 10 to the minus 35 meters. It's, it's, it's the limit of quantum mechanics. It's the limit beyond which you can't probe any deeper. Um, and that's, that's what they say the width of the string is. So if you now, if you do that calculation, you're up to something like one part in 10 to the 52. And 10 to the, you know, first of all, 10 to the, one part in 10 to the 30th is equivalent to a grain of sand is to the size of the earth. So one part in 10 to the 52 is like a grain of sand, you know, in the solar system or maybe the galaxy or something. I'm not even sure. I haven't done that Jeez. calculation, but it's, it's ridiculously empty. And, you know, I start thinking, well, what's the point of having stuff anyway? Um, the trend is that every, 60 years or so, we lose about 15 orders of magnitude of density of our stuff in the in the best theories of science. So if we keep going in that direction, we're heading toward the you know the ultimate, which is there really is no stuff. It's really just data, which to me is it's kind of a, one of these big trends that I see happening in uh, you know scientific um, theory, and as we we kind of peel the onion of of what makes all of this tick of what the rules are in science. We peel it back further and further. We find that there's less and less stuff, and probably at the end of the day, there's none. All of it is data and rules. And if you think about it, if the string theorists are right, they say that um, a particle is only defined by one number, and that number is the frequency that that string is vibrating at. Well, if you can define a particle by one number, what do you need the string for anyway? You just have the number. Mm-hmm. You see what yeah. I'm saying? So, so you know, and, and, and people will argue, well, I feel stuff. You know, I put my hand on the table and I and I feel this the, the hardness of it. And well, actually, you don't. What you're what you're experiencing is the um, charge, you know, electromagnetic right? charge. Yeah, electromagnetic field charge of of the atoms in your fingertips repelling against the electromagnetic field charge in the atoms of the of the table and what you're seeing is reflected light you know off of that and when you really think about this very deeply um, it's it's okay to say that everything is data and everything is, is data and rules and so when I punch a wall the rule is that you know I'm I'm going to I'm going to f- Get a, a, a you know a sensation that is the result of the you know very deep rules of uh, electromagnetic interaction and how they translate to pressure and things like that 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 get converted into bits in my nervous system and get processed by my mind. Um, so when you when you really think through this stuff, there's no evidence for any stuff at all, um, and there's there's really a lot of evidence that we're heading toward a trend of um, recognizing that everything is just made of data and rules. So that's more evidence for a uh, you know a digital world or a programmed world. Yeah, man, it's it's really hard to wrap my head around it. And another thing, another component to this is the idea of the conscious observer. I mean, there's been some experiments that seem to suggest that uh, waves stay waves until they have a conscious observer and then they become particles or they make some type of choice. Again, it's pretty over my head, but it, uh, there are those studies out there. What do you make of that? What, where, what role do you think uh, human consciousness plays? Yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, really the, the way is a great question. I, I think that is kind of the key um, fundamental aspect of what is under investigation today in any field of science. It's the key thing that is showing that our reality isn't what we think it is. 
Everything else that we're studying is just kind of peeling back the onion. But this observer effect that you're talking about um, and some of the aspects of quantum mechanics and entanglement and things like that are showing that deep, deep down, um, our reality is very, very different from the mechanistic type of approach that you know most scientists have believed over the years. Um, and in this experiment you're talking about, this double slit experiment has been you know replicated countless times. And the, and the way that it works is that every time human consciousness gets involved in observing the result of the experiment, the experiment sort of locks into a particular result. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the way this experiment works is you have a little detector on the um, back side of a, a, effectively like a cardboard that has slits in it, and you're sh shooting particles through that, and the detector t detects whether, um, you know, whether the particle went through one slit or another. And if you have that detector there and you're looking at the results of the detector so that you as a human know where each particle is going through, then you no longer get that, that waveform. Um, but if you turn the detector off, or if you let the detector on but somehow um, are not paying attention to the detector or you know, having a, you know, a conscious observation, there will be um, a waveform on the, on the screen. So they've, they, they've tried to tease out all the possible explanations of this weird effect, like uh, they used to think, well, maybe it has to do with the fact that the detector is stealing away a little bit of energy from these particles or something, and, and that was disproven um, not too long ago uh, in, in uh, Tel Aviv, a uh, scientific lab there. Um, and finally, in uh, I think it was 2008, these physicists in, in Vienna determined to a ridiculous uh, level of certainty, uh, 80 orders of certainty, um, meaning the odds of this being chance were 1 in you know, 10 to the 80th kind of thing, um, that, that reality doesn't exist at all until we observe it. So what do I make of that? You know, I, I think about it from the programmatic standpoint, if I were creating a reality that is programmatic, I would do it exactly this way, and, and here's why. Um, let's say you want to create a, um, a, I don't know, a coffee cup or something. Mm -hmm. right, let, let's, let's use a tree because it's bigger. Um, that's, that's the one that I typically use. So do you really have to define what's inside the tree? Um, you don't. And from a programmatic standpoint, it would take an awful lot of memory resources and computational resources to calculate the structure of things that nobody's ever going to look at. So mm -hmm. you don't bother doing that. If I were creating this kind of you know, simulation program, all I would create is what people can experience. So now as soon as somebody cuts into the tree, there has to be um, something that generates the, the construct of the tree. Now, if you take a piece out of the middle of that tree and put it under a microscope, now there has to be something that generates, you know, something at a deeper mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the stuff on the tree, we don't have to care about, you know, at that level. So, you know, the, the further down you go in, in, this, in this thinking, um, you realize that once you get down to the particle level, now I'm looking at uh, a number of particles and they have to have some rules. They have to be, be behaving in a certain way because I, I am measuring them, I am observing them. So now we've made those particles lock into a particular state. That's exactly what happens in quantum mechanics. That's called decoherence. And that's, you know, that's why these effects occur. Everything else is probabilities until we um, force the program to generate reality. You know, in mm -hmm. in our minds, that then then you get things locked in. Um, that's why entanglement occurs. You can take particles and move them light years apart from each other. Um, of course, they haven't been able to do that in experiments. They've done miles and 20 miles or something like that. But they've proven that these things are they act as one particle. They don't act as two particles anymore. And the re the reason I would say is because they're following rules of the program in lockstep. You know, the program is saying, well, you know, there's like a little uh, 
state machine, if you will. You know, the program is saying, okay, when this particle has the spin up, this particle over here has spin down. And every time it clocks through another calculation of reality, it, it sets those two particles to be equivalent. So for all intents and purposes, those particles are one and the same. It's like two, two pixels on the computer screen that you look at. Every mm -hmm. clock cycle, those two pixels are being repainted. So the underlying construct that drives those pixels is something that's uh, very consistent. You could move those pixels, you know, far apart from each other, and still every clock cycle they'll they'll get repainted. It doesn't make any difference how far apart they are because they're they're all driven by the same underlying mechanism. So that that to me is a perfect explanation for every quantum mechanics anomaly. And I I have on my my site um, actually the kind of like pseudocode, um, little, little bits of pseudo software, if you will, that explains the observer effect and entanglement and non-locality and all these things that you know, the scientists are kind of beating their head against the wall trying to figure out. It, it's perfectly logical if you think about it from a simulation standpoint. Yeah, I mean, how funny would it be to find out that looking outward into space or down under a bigger and bigger microscope is just fruitless because it will always unravel to be something else. Like we're like we're living in an infinite field of waves, and the further you look out, the universe will just manifest more galaxies, more stars, more, you know, nebulas, and yep. it just will never end. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that was, that was, it's interesting you, you mentioned that. I had a blog recently, too, about these, um, you know, sort of the another mega trend, humanity mega trend of what our perception of all that there is is, and it has changed maybe I don't know nine or ten times over the history of humanity. There was one point in time you could imagine that there were you know during a tribal era when people thought that all that existed was their tribes and the dominion that they lived in. Um, and then along comes some other tribe from miles away and, and uh, conquers them or whatever, and they realize, wow, the, our, our, our view of reality is much bigger than we previously thought. It's a whole level bigger, and it mm -hmm. maybe expands now to a continent. And then at some point they realize that, wow, there are other continents on this planet, and at some point we realize there's other planets, and then we realize there's other solar systems, and so on and so on. And the interesting thing is that if you plot the dates at which we become aware that there's yet one more um, level of expansiveness to our worldview, if you will, um, they follow an, a perfect exponential pattern. Um, and uh, the last one was, uh, again, in, say, like the 1990s, uh, people like Max Tegmark talk, talked about the multiverse theory. Um, and postulated all kinds of uh, ways that there could be uh, parallel realities and parallel universes. Well, we're actually due for another one, and um, there there is another one, and this other one is exactly what we're talking about tonight. It's it, it goes a little bit beyond the idea that we're just in a simulation. It it, it explores the idea that if we're in a simulation, there is something that created it. So therefore. All that we can know is in the simulation, but there's something else out there that created it. And <laughs> what that reality is, is beyond the multiverse concept, because the multiverse concept still talks about physical realities. Um, the, you know, the next level of, of thinking here is non-physical realities. And, and this is where uh, folks like Tom Campbell and Stephen Kaufman go um, in, into, you know, sort of a, a bigger description of what all that there is could be. Hmm. Um, and it's interesting that if, if you don't think about that, you're, you're always in kind of a bubble, and your bubble is everything that you know, and, and so therefore you have to explain everything that you observe by, by what's within your bubble. But if you can somehow understand that there's something outside of that bubble and try to infer what that is or maybe travel to it or whatever. And I think we do travel to that when we, you know, travel, you know, consciously. Um, then 
you can realize that that the you know that uh, the mechanisms that created our bubble are different, and and they mm-hmm. can explain some of the things that we see. It gives you a whole different perspective on the world that we're living in and the purpose that that we have and things like that. So it's um, really very interesting to kind of go down that path. And it's a little bit beyond yeah. just pure simulation theory. It's, you know, it's what's what else is out there, you know. Well, on the subject of the bubble, of being in the program, what is, are there any clues to suggest what could possibly be there, what we could possibly see if someone pulled the plug on that program? Yeah, I think when uh, when people die they they get a clue yeah. um i don't know if you've uh, f- followed much of uh, the the near death experience research or say out of body experience research yeah. but these bit. are yeah these are these are cases and it's not uh, this isn't pseudoscience i mean these these are real scientific studies that have been done um you know over many years that there there is a, a consistency of uh, of reports that people have um, their behavior changes after these things, which wouldn't make sense if it was hallucinatory. Um, you know, there are things that they experience that that then can be uh, corroborated later on, like um, you know, uh, past life regressions, perhaps, or um, you know, telepathy or uh, clairvoyance or something like that. Remote viewing. I mean. You know, the army funded remote viewing for like 20 years, so yeah. you know it wasn't it wasn't that uh, that didn't work. I think they yeah. would have killed the program if it didn't work at all. Right. So 20 years that they tell us about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so anyway, these these things go outside of the the bubble that w- that I referred to before, and so this is evidence. It's tricky evidence because it isn't necessarily as reproducible as. A lot of scientists would like. Mm-hmm. But science, science isn't all about reproducibility. You know, something isn't science just because it's reproducible. There's lots of things that take, uh, you know, geology, for example. Um, you know, scientists try to infer why a particular geological formation occurred. That formation will never occur again exactly as it was. It may have been due to a unique event, a meteor or something like that. So... Reproducibility isn't isn't required for for science. Um, a, a, a sum total of a lot of anecdotal information or uh, survey information and things like that is real science. In, in psychological studies, that's real science. So, yeah. So I go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, you you can go for it. I'm here all the time. Yeah. No, I was going to say that that you know these these kinds of studies into what might otherwise be called paranormal just because. It doesn't fit in with the sort of materialist paradigm. These kind of studies are exploring, um, you know, that next level of, quote, all that there is. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I think that's really, really interesting. It is. It's almost like that's that's the beauty of the design is that the illusion is so strong. Like we talked about the discoveries that... The, un- the world that we think is made up of stuff is mostly empty. You know, the illusion is very strong, and I think that that's the kicker to it is that these types of out-of-body experience, I kind of think out-of-body experience, near-death experiences, dreams, um, psychedelic trips, I mean, even the fact that we call them trips, you know, that's like a journey. You know, I do think that those kind of things are all related and they're all clues, but the funny thing about it, the big joke is that You can only have that experience for yourself. So you may get a clue, a major clue, about what exists outside the bubble, but you can't share it with anyone. It's like trying to explain the color green to a guy who's been blind his whole life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, (laughs) this is, yeah, I thought about all of this in in the sense of a sort of a, um, I don't know, like a a line or a spectrum of what I would call uh, consensus reality. So when you dream, you're, you're by yourself. You're you're in your own mind and you're experiencing something, um, some energy, some organizational structure of an experience, right? You're, you're experiencing that, um, but you're doing it maybe by yourself. And so, therefore, you have the freedom to make of it what you will. 
uh, if you can lucid dream, you can you can now mold it and and so forth. Mm-hmm. Now there are studies of people who do mutual lucid dreaming, and now when when that happens, um, the people who are mutual lucid dreaming, there's a little bit of consensus that has to happen. They they have to experience the same thing in a similar way. It doesn't have to necessarily be exact, but it's more toward that consensus reality side of the spectrum and, and not toward the, you know, personal fantasy type of the spectrum. In our day-to-day reality, we're very much toward the consensus reality end of the spectrum because a car drives by and it's blue and you see it and I see it and we have to both say, hey, you know, we saw the same thing. But, you know, so, so we have this consensus and that's what makes us think that this physical reality is so, quote, real, Mm -hmm. and that the other stuff is not. It's just the consensus. But a consensus can be generated programmatically, too. Um, If you're playing a a, a virtual uh, reality game um, on the computer with a bunch of people, you know, logged in from around the world, and everybody is shown the exact same thing, and a blue car drives by, and you say to some guy, in Japan, hey, did you see that blue car? And he says, yeah, I saw it too. Because the program has has presented that to both of you. Um, now you feel like, wow, now I can really trust what I'm seeing because everybody else is seeing the same thing. Mm-hmm. But what if what if that guy is shown something different, shown something because of his level of expertise or his level of knowledge or his uh, health points or whatever it is? And this happens in games. It's It's an easy thing to program. Mm-hmm. Now you have a little bit less consensus. That guy sees a UFO and I don't see it. Um, or that guy experiences the, the monster in a different way than I do. Um, it's all very possible and it explains all of our less than perfect uh, experiences of reality when compared to what other people experience. And it happens a lot of times. People will say, well, I saw one thing and somebody else saw something else. Mm-hmm. That's Okay. You know, that, that that all fits within this paradigm. You know, on the subject of lucid dreaming, it's almost like lucid dreaming is the placebo effect of that plane because it almost ties into the power of thought. Because in a dream, 9 out of 10 times, you think everything is real. You think the danger is real. Everything that's seen, that in your waking life you look at is, wow, that was completely strange and impossible. It seems very real. But then there's these people who have lucid dreams where they just completely realize it isn't and completely take control of it. And then, you know, in our waking life, we have this thing, the placebo effect, which is a very similar thing, just just nerfed. It's very nerfed. But, um, you know, if there's plenty of cases of people who get better because they believe that they were given medicine when in reality they were given sugar pills or whatever. Um, it's very strange. I mean, how far do you think... You could follow that thread. Do you, how far do you, much do you think you could manifest your own reality, if at all? Yeah, well, so I think, I think this is very much related to the observer effect that we talked about before. Mm-hmm. When, when, we, when our consciousness interacts with matter, um, we create a reality. We, in the quantum mechanical terms, we collapse that wave function. We collapse that probability into an actual place and in, in, in time. Um, because of the, the, the program has to do that. So the same thing happens with our future. Our future is all probabilities, isn't it? And if this physical reality is really just virtual, is just data that we're, that we're consciously processing, then we have more control for things that are further in the future than we do for things that are going to happen in one second. Because remember, the stuff that's going to happen in one second has to fit with everybody else's consensus. Um, so you got a guy sitting next to you, and, and the two of you are watching a baseball game, and one of you tries to you know, consciously make the, the player hit a home run, and the other one tries to consciously make the player strike out. You, know, you, you can't both win that. So only one of those things is going to happen, whereas... You know, further out in the future, there isn't so much, you're not so close to a, a consensus or a locked in thing. You can influence things further out into the future. I mean, the, theoretically, that, that all makes kind of sense mm-hmm. to me. You know, the program is, you know, if, if you believe in this kind of construct and, 
and I always say that I'm, I'm not, you know, 100% sure of it, but the evidence, my book is about evidence. It's not about, you know, I know this to be true or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you, you know, you, you kind of uh, think about this, uh, you know, this uh, power of positive thinking uh, kind of aspect to it, then, you know, really there's no reason why you can't um, control your destiny to some extent, uh, interact with people through means other than our normal communication and all these kind of things that could be possible in um, in a program. We don't necessarily know what the rules are of this simulation. We right. push the boundaries of them with studies like remote viewing and experiences like near-death experiences and so forth. Um, and through those studies, we're starting to learn a little bit about what we can do and what we can't do. The placebo effect is showing us that we real, our minds, which are not in our brains, our minds are probably somewhere else, mm-hmm. uh, really, really can influence and, and change uh, our outcomes. Well, it's funny because the idea of manifesting the reality, I would love for it to be true, but I have so much doubt. And in the conspiracy world, a lot of people believe that the elite's main objective through media manipulation and news manipulation is to create doubt and to create fear because maybe – the manifesting of reality is completely possible if you believe it, but yet we're conditioned to have so much doubt in ourselves that no one ever really can commit 100% to the premise because they've just gone through decades of being told that that's bullshit. Yeah, I think that's that's re- that's really insightful. I think that's a, a, a good way of looking at it, that um, if, if we were fully free to... Um, and this is one of Tom Campbell's arguments, if we were fully free to uh, make of our reality what we want to make of it, we wouldn't learn as much as we do. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, in in his philosophy, and and this is something that kind of resonates with me, um, and and to be honest, you know, from from a standpoint of digital philosophy and digital physics, there's a lot of different, uh, views and a lot of different people out there who have been thinking about this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, it's important that uh, that we not be able to uh, fully influence everything. If everybody was able to um, influence whatever that they wanted, they wouldn't uh, learn as much. So, um, you know, some of the constraints that we have in terms of what we can, how we can communicate with others, what we can know about what's outside of the bubble what we can know about a past life if we had them. Um, those kind of constraints are important so that we can uh, learn faster and, and you know, add to uh, the overall evolution of our ourselves. Uh, All right. If you, if, you, if you were to plot the amount of knowledge or wisdom that you attain, it probably is very steep early in your life, but as you get, you know, older, uh, it flattens out and, and you don't, you know, gain that much more. So the the system, if you will, in order to optimize how much, uh, you know, consciousness quality there there is, it would have to, um, you know, I- encourage entities to, to live, um, you know, early in this cycle. So perhaps that's why there's death. Perhaps that's that's why we reincarnate. You know, this is all something that kind of fits in this theory. Yeah, man, it's it's super fascinating. It kind of uh, <clears throat> has a lot of parallels to the Zen philosophy that, you know, we just are the universe. The main difference just being, you know, is there are we the creator, are we the programmer, or is there some external programmer? Because I guess the big question is how does the program decide to put rings on the inside of a tree trunk when you cut it open? You know, does it come from our own subconscious, what we would expect to see, we see? Or is the program using some other algorithm to create that stuff? You know, that's right. kind of a the fun, so, kind of one of the fundamental questions. Yeah, it's a good question, and I, I think uh, kind of using sort of a collection of ideas from uh, shamanistic thinking, Zen philosophy, modern digital philosophy. Mm-hmm. The, the program, um, if you want to call it that, or the system, has evolved, and it's evolved to. Uh, learn to do what is best. So if the best thing is for uh, for it to be really efficient, 
um, and generate those, uh, you know, the content of the rings of the trees, then that's what it's going to evolve to. I mean, if you think about sort of the theory of natural selection, Darwin's theory follows a similar type of approach. Um, you know, the, the sheep that have the thicker wool in the high cold altitudes um, tend to pass on their genes more, whereas the others don't. So uh, an artificial intelligence or, or a system of consciousness that is evolving um, is going to do different experiments, and the, the experiments that have positive or profitable results will get encouraged, and the ones that don't won't and the thing will eventually evolve to be efficient. Uh, so this this actually, you know, it. it I read a, a book recently, uh, a Zen book, and I read a passage in it, and I thought, oh, my gosh, this sounds exactly like digital philosophy. And it's, it's amazing that people thought the same way as, you know, some of us who are in this field are thinking now, and we've come at it from... Uh, technology and physics and um, all these diff different, you know, fields, um, mm -hmm. but but it's matching and that's really cool. That's almost it's almost telling us we're onto something. Yeah, there definitely seems to be this meeting in the middle between psychedelic adventures, um, certain religions, and old Gnostic ideas, and modern science. It's it's pretty. It is a pretty interesting culmination, and it's. It's uh, funny because if you look at history, how opposed these different areas were, and as they all advance, they all seem to be, you know, coming to the middle. Maybe we're getting close to something. Yeah, and I, I think I think we are, and I think that it's uh, it's important to stay open minded, and I think that there are uh, very close close minded individuals on both sides of that fence, and. Some of them are pretty loud, and it's unfortunate yes. because um, you know all we're trying to do is uh, is seek the truth here, and 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 do it without you know being told what we're allowed to think and what we're not allowed to think. Right. Well, it's it's another curious thing not to be too conspiratorial, but are those dogmatic voices in science, you know, are they popular because the People who don't want us to know the truth are in charge of the media, are in charge of what we see and who gets to be the loudest voice, and they purposely put those people up there for a reason, um, just to keep us in the dark a little bit longer. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I tend to think a little differently. I think that I think it was uh, Gandhi who once said, um, an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less until they know everything about nothing. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not to disparage, you know, anyone who has gotten their Ph.D. in a particular field um, or some advanced degree or really focuses on being an expert in a very narrow thing. But you can't be an expert in everything. So when you are an expert in a very narrow field, which tend to be scientists, um, people who write papers, people who, uh, uh, you know, do the experiments and, and get known for these things, um, when you do have that very narrow but very deep set of knowledge, if somebody comes along and pulls it out from under you, your whole reason for being, your whole, you know, reason for getting funding, you know, that helps pay your mortgage and, and you know, maintains your, your stature at your university or whatever, that all, that all goes away. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of uh, fear and defense mechanism that happens when, people start challenging some of these uh, very uh, very old ideas. Oh, I totally agree with you that that is the reality, but I guess um, I just have more of a question of if it's just unfortunate, uh, unfortunately the way it is, or if it's a result of careful planning to orchestrate that system. But uh, another thing I wanted to ask you about was the idea of, you know, as we look out into the universe, it manifesting itself as we look further and further and develop the ability to do so. How do you think that could apply to extraterrestrials? Do you think maybe being more open to the idea in modern times, um, having more of an expectation of the possibility of finding something, that it might actually bring it to fruition? Yeah, I think there's something to that. Um, you know, th they may be um, other uh, organized, conscious uh, entities in the greater um, field of consciousness, a as we are, um, just different, 
and uh, the rules of our interaction are are different than what the rules of our interaction with ourselves are. Um, you know, that's sort of how the way I would look at it. Uh, you know, if we want to make more contact, we probably the more that we get in touch with this, you know, idea of how um, there's one global consciousness, um, and re- make, maybe make requests for. Uh, those interactions uh, might might bring us closer. Yeah, it's a curious thing. Maybe we're already deeply in those communications and we just don't know it. <laughs> we might be. <laughs> um, it might be some of what happens uh, in the dream state too. Yeah, totally agree. Um, hey, it's been great talking to you, man. Before we go, I wanted to ask you one other thing. Uh, it seems like I... I see new crazy scientific discoveries like every other day online, whether I understand it or not. But... What are some of the more recent things to come out of the internet that that you've seen that most interest you? Uh, well, one of them that I just uh, saw last night was fascinating. Um, was a uh, study with some experimental evidence that that shows that time may come out of this whole entanglement idea. So, um, huh. time time itself exists within the sort of the bubble of space where things are entangled and outside of it time doesn't exist at all um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around this but this this one I mean it, it feels to me intuitively like it may be another piece of the puzzle it might be something mm-hmm. that um, you know can can give us some more uh, you know, enlightenment about the way uh, the greater reality works. Yeah. Almost, that, that, that's, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's almost like um, an evolution of the same principle that, you know, the reality we look at, the stuff we look at feels so solid, looks so solid, but it's mainly empty. You know, time feels like such a fundamental necessity, yet, you know, if if there was a way to explore it deeper, we might find that, you know, there's more timelessness than timeness. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and uh, there was also a uh, an article about some uh, people from uh, Arizona State. Uh, Paul Davies was one of the ones, a very uh, well known scientist, that um, the, that the transition from inorganic to or- organic life was based on information and not chemistry. Well, that all fits in perfectly with with the the uh, programmed reality idea as well. So a lot, a lot of you know, cool things that people are starting to think about if they stay open-minded. Yeah, right on, man. I mean, I think I'm not a smart man, but I'm an open-minded man. So some of the sometimes that's uh, sometimes that's better. Well, you you ask some great questions, so <laughs> I'd, I'd put you on the smart side. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate your kindness, but well, man, it has been a blast talking to you. Even though I feel more insignificant than ever, I'm somehow still in a good <laughs> mood. Um, I think that's okay. I do too, and uh, I'm I'm all right with that. <laughs> for sure. Um, do you want to tell the people a little bit about your book and your website before we go? Oh, sure. Yeah, the the book is called The Universe Solved. It's uh, available on Amazon, um, both in a, a hardback form and a Kindle version. Uh, the website is theuniversesolved.com, and that's um, you know probably be doing an overhaul of that in the, over the next year or so. Um, right now, it's a uh, it's got a lot of interactivity on it. There's a forum. There's uh, my blog, um, polls, all kinds of things where people can uh, interact and explore things. And I uh, just want to kind of bring it up to date a little bit. So there's even a, a, an artificial intelligence on there uh, named Morpheus that you can – a <laughs> chat bot that you can chat with. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm always uh, interested in talking to people, too, uh, about these kinds of things. So if anybody has ideas, wants to explore uh, anything, um, they can they can follow me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, uh, send me emails, whatever. It all works. Right on. Very cool. Jim, thanks again, and be sure to give me a call when you get this whole reality thing sorted out, all right? <laughs> okay, thanks, Greg. Great, uh, great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Right, Take care. Bye-bye.